So I think most of us will agree that a good score can give a good game that little extra that, to really make it shine. Uh, our next speakers are here to share how they tackle that challenge. So please welcome Disaster Peace and Peter Curry. Hello. Hi. It's good to see so many people here. We're really thrilled to be here uh, and really excited to talk a little bit about this, uh, this project that we worked on for a couple years. Yeah, it should be good. I had to uh, <laughs> dig into the, the I haven't worked on the, the audio for about a year now, so I had to rediscover it all for, for, for this talk, which was, which was fun. Peter was frantically going through the code for the game and making sure he understood all the things that we did so that we'd be prepared. On the flight here. Same, yeah. same for me, too. Because this, this game is uh, uh, a bit unusual in, in its process in that we spent a lot of time just trying all kinds of weird stuff. And so the... Uh, yeah, we just, we just spent months, like creating lots of weird little features that I kind of forgot about and had to revisit. Yes, yeah, the, the audio definitely uh, became a lot more entangled with the game than we ever expected. So, uh, my name is Rich Freeland. I make music under the name Disasterpiece. I'm a freelance sound artist from Los Angeles, California. This is Peter Curry. Yeah, and I'm a software developer. Um, I'm in Wellington, New Z Z Zealand. Uh, I've worked at a studio as a programmer for four and a half or so years making a whole bunch of games that you'll never will have heard of. Um, <laughs> uh, then I've done indie stuff since 2006. Oh, you've uh, oh, lost the slides. What happened? Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, on and off, but the first game that I ever got anywhere with was Mini Metro. So this is... Um, yeah, so my brother and I worked on a prototype for the game, which is what you're seeing here. So this is one that we built in a weekend. Uh, it was designed as sort of like an interactive subway map, in a way. So it's, it's kind of a stripped-down version of SimCity, Sim where all you're caring about is uh, building the lines to connect the stations, uh, and the stations open up as the game advances automatically. Hopefully soon it'll... There, there we go. Um, so then you just edit lines to try to get the passengers around. So so we worked on this in April 2013 and very very quickly decided that we wanted to turn it into a, into a commercial release. Um, and the one thing we didn't have... Oh, so, so that the reason we came up with the idea for a subway map game was because we didn't have any artists with us and this was the first time we actually um, figured, well, how do we make a game with that? Any artists. But the one thing we also didn't have was any audio, but um, we definitely had a, an idea for the audio in the game. Um, so then w one thing led to another and we got in touch with Rich. Yeah, so, so what did you guys want? Yeah, so I remember, because um, we always had this idea for procedural audio, so we didn't want just a scored track or anything. We wanted a, uh, like a soundscape, an ambient soundscape that was all derived from uh, all of the in-game actions, you know, uh, passengers appearing, stations appearing, all of that, um, all of the actions that happen in, in the game. And Rich was the go-to guy at that point, for because you'd done your January... I was the go-to guy, but you had another fellow who you were working with. Oh, who, yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, there was, there was your there first, was a first choice. Right <laughs> yeah, there was actually a, a really... Um, there was a great guy locally who was really, really into press digital audio, so we actually had him all, uh, all set to go, but then one thing led to another and that didn't yeah. happen. So, then so you guys found, you found this game I worked on called January? Is yeah, yeah, which was, which was all fully procedural. Yeah. So I made this little game called January where you walk around and you're a little character and, it's, and it snows and you lick the snowflakes and it generates music and the music is always different every time you play and I think that was kind of like, oh, we can do something like that. Um, yeah, that, that was definitely, yeah, that was the, one of the things that we, we wanted to imbue our game with, was to have right. this thing where you, you, you have control over the audio, but uh, still the audio has to sound good as well, right? So, of course, the um, audio has to sound good. So I remember once... You don't uh, learn anything from this talk. <laughs> um, so, so my vision uh, for the game... Um, 
uh, I played the game and, and got really excited about the, uh, the uh, prospect of working on it. And I kind of saw this, you know, this idea of, oh, it'd be really cool if the entire audio experience is kind of like, oops, yeah, it's kind of like a sonic symbiosis. And what I mean by that is that like the music and the sound effects and the audio, it all kind of, it all kind of behaves as a singular entity. So you can't really tell the difference between you know, the sounds of passengers getting on trains and the trains moving and the UI and stuff. It all kind of just seamlessly blends into a singular experience. And so the way that uh, I wanted to go about doing that was to create one-to-one an -one analogies. And what I mean by that is like, um, like uh, trains, uh, passengers, all these things are like very important objects in the world and that they'd have like a certain, they'd have a certain language attached to them that was always the same. And so one of the things that will show like over time that we figured out is that like, you have all these different kinds of passengers and stations, which um, if I go back real quick, you can kind of see. So you have like, you know, uh, these are stations, the, the, the outlined circles and squares and triangles are stations that have different shapes. And then the passengers also have shapes. The passenger shape dictates where they want to go. So this little square guy is getting picked up to go because he wants to go to the square station. And so there was like a consistent language there. Um, and so tapping into that, like, you know, how can we uh, create a consistent language with the audio? And so we, we'll, we'll get into um, where that took, took me. Um, but basically each shape was, would have a, a specific kind of sound attached to it. And that goes, it, it goes a pretty long way in kind of establishing the language of the, of the system. And so the other thing that was really important for me was, you know, I knew that the audio had to have an uh, carry uh, emotional weight and it had to make the experience of playing this game, which I think on the surface feels, can feel fairly meditative, but the longer you play the game, the more elaborate and complicated the, the subway system gets and the harder it gets to manage your actions. And so it can actually get a little bit stressful. Would you agree? Yes, that's kind of the way the <laughs> game's designed, really. But yeah, very early on, I remember I sent you an email, Rich, about you know, what, what our high-level aims for the, the audio was. And one of the things we wanted was that uh, the audio would be like listening to the engine, you know, so you can tell when it's going well and when something's going wrong. So that was, we definitely wanted it to be in, in uh, like a game aid, almost. Like, right. it, like if you could, you could watch the game, and, and, but also hear the game to get an idea of how right. well you're playing. And I, I kind of wanted to take that idea, but also I wanted to be able to diffuse some of the stress that the game creates so that the player doesn't get too overwhelmed. And so we went to great lengths to make sure certain things, like the sound of when you have a, a station that has too many passengers in it and the passengers start jumping, like, hey, look at me. You know, If you don't pick these passengers up soon, the game will end. Those sounds we iterated on quite a bit to make sure that they weren't uh, too stressful. Like we didn't want, you know, loud, like, ur, ur, ur. like, look at me, you know, it had to be like kind of subtle. Um, and so utility was really important. Um, utility in terms of, you know, there's all this information happening. You have passengers moving around, you're, you're drawing, you're connecting different train uh, stations to each other with different lines and stuff. Uh, the utility of how these, all these things interact is really important. And so it was a matter, it became really important to try to create a hierarchy of, you know, uh, like, Passengers get is passengers getting on trains. Uh, passengers getting off trains. You know which one which one of those things is more important. Um, and so that's one of the things that we had to figure out just over the course of like prototyping. And so utility first, and then the emotional stuff, which was also important, but I wanted that to come in underneath as a secondary uh, objective. So that was kind of my like initial plan for for the soundtrack. But before all of that, like. Uh yeah, so we re released the game in, in Early Access and Steam. Do you want to go back? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so we released the game in Early Access and Steam a long time before the audio. Um, in fact, it was only a couple of months after we got in touch with you, I think. Uh, just for financial concerns, it isn't why I would ever recommend re releasing a game early, but it uh, worked out okay for us. Um, we were expecting to get a pretty uh, toxic reception, but th thankfully we didn't really get too many comments like th th this one. And, and overall, the, the game was actually really well re received on Steam. 
but uh, there's always going to be at least one person who has oh, yeah. a, who has oh, a yeah. problem with whatever you could possibly <laughs> imagine doing. Yeah, but um, yeah, we didn't have audio in the build, so that was in. Uh, yeah, so we went on Greenlight in 2014. Greenlight 2014, March. and then released in early access in August 2014, and it was still. Maybe not quite a year, maybe just over a year. I can't remember yeah, until we actually like, had so audio. We, the game was in green light for over a year with no audio. And so there was like a there was a small but a vocal uh, audience of people who were uh, really in, intrigued and, and maybe frustrated. Yeah, it's it's always the problem when you've got missing features in early access. Um, um, like we, we actually had a lot of people who were uh, like complaints like, how come the sound's not on? And you know, I haven't, haven't yeah. gotten the audio yet. Um, and... and and it, 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 because it didn't have any audio for so long, it gave people a lot of chance, a lot, a lot of time to think about what the audio could be like when it yeah. was in. Especially once we said that disaster piece was. So there were a lot of people audio. who had ideas that they wanted to share. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and once you've allowed your fans to gestate their ideas for long enough time, like there's no way intense. you can ever meet their expectations. So. Uh, but we we chose not to put audio in it for a while because. The system that that we were trying to build was so uh, so not a traditional like oh we'll put some loops of music in there and it'll we'll just iterate on it. It's kind of this thing where the system didn't really work until it it worked. So we yeah. spent like a year before it got to the point where I felt comfortable. I think yeah we couldn't sort of iterate in front of everyone. Um, I mean we probably could have, but we chose not to. It, it would have scared some people. It's hard enough iterating the game in early access, let alone this experimental it's audio It's tough because thing. Like any, like every day the system would be in a different state of being because it's so volatile and, and program, pro, like just iterative programming all the time. So one day the system might be working really great and the next day it's completely broken. And so it didn't really make sense. Um, people wanted to like, also people wanted to mute the sound and the music separately, which... Uh, we yeah, we just is not we've possible. just got a <laughs> just inherently to the way the audio is done in the game. We just have an audio on or off, and we yeah. always get people asking, "Can I just want to switch off the the sound?" It's like, well, <laughs> what's sound and what's music? Right. But so um so yeah, we went. So I started getting into like an early audio prototyping phase where I just tried to figure out, you know, what is this going to look like? And so one of the earliest ideas I had was, what if the music in the game was a representation of uh, a week in the life of a commuter, and so the reason that the reason that I thought of this is that the game runs on a on a weekly clock. Like you know, every hour goes by, like was like 0.8 seconds per hour or something. So it's like tick, 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 and then at the end of the week, you get a screen that kind of tells you your progress, and you get upgrades to your s system. You can you can buy tunnels to go under, underwater, you can add trains and carriages to your system, you can add new lines to your system. So I was thinking about it in very, this very modular way. So what if, we had, what if we had music that would represent a week in the life of the commuter? So this is kind of an early, very early prototype. Um, I actually just realized, do we, do we have sound? This guy? No, but that's okay. Improvise. Knowing audio talk has audio. It's Let's see if this works. Thank you. 
sense of time and place. <laughs> didn't really end up like this at all uh, but it was a really important exercise early on to kind of start to experiment with what uh, what the aesthetics will be of the game um, and kind of the kind of feelings that the that the that the sound should give you emotionally so that was a really important exercise and uh, here's another early audio prototype that actually I believe this one has that track laid underneath it, but it's it's kind of quiet. So initially, I was thinking, you know, I'll like I'll, I'll add all these like procedural elements on top of like a, a set piece of music, so that you kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, ultimately, we ended up doing that. But here's here's one of the first prototypes where I like I basically took some footage from the game and I threw it into my music sequencer Logic and just started like putting sounds to it and trying to figure out. What, what things what things will sound like and how how will the systems interact sonically long drawn out tones that were kind of supposed to represent the different lines and when you draw them they kind of come alive and you start to hear them and then having like trains on the lines that have an engine sound where the engine would actually be pitched to the line um, and just starting to figure out like you know like some of the analogies there yeah I remember early on you, you worked on that spreadsheet or whatever of just like all of the possible things you could use all, all of the game events and, and yeah. game information you could use to and how you there make the audio there's a very long list it. of like potential ideas that we had about how systems yeah. can interact with each I other which I, we won't I, bore, bore you with I, I remember the first time <laughs> I saw that document I was like oh my goodness <laughs> this guy's going overboard so here's another early audio prototype and this one we're start, I'm starting to figure out those analogies and trying new ideas so this one has a, a, a an idea in it that's a little hard to hear but it was an idea that I was really keen on early. It was this idea called train beat. And the idea was that you'd have, uh, so in the game, you know, you have, these, you have these trains that go to station to station, they pick up passengers, and when the passengers get picked up, they show up in the train as a little shape. And usually they can hold six. And so my idea was that when the train is moving and it has passengers in it, the number of passengers in the train and their position in the train could be uh, performed like a, like a sequencer. So if, if it's like seat one has a guy in it, seat two doesn't have a passenger, seat three does, seat four does, and then five and six don't, that'd be like bop, 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 and let's just like keep going all around the system. We didn't end up using that, but you can see a little bit in, the, in this video. Starting an experiment with like more rhythmic elements. So that's like the sound of the little square passenger in the train. Little circle guy. stations appearing was something that I kind of figured out really early it seemed to work well like when a new station appears it's really important that the player knows that it's there 
before it was easy to lose track of stations. So to have a loud sound that's like, hey, there's a new station, it's not connected to your system, you gotta, you gotta add. Yeah, there was, uh, there was one part where the audio helped really early on, because there was always a complaint here, like, I didn't realize this thing had appeared, and having that big doom. So I think at this point, in the prototyping phase, I think I felt pretty confident that, okay, this is probably gonna work. It needs, <laughs> it needs, uh, it needs to be worked with and like, and massaged to, to do the right things all the time. But in in theory, it should, it should work out okay. But now we just have to figure out how the hell are we gonna do this? Uh, how are we gonna program this? Yeah, to scale us up from a prototype that was done in. A, in because this was something I just did in, in a sequencer, you know, in Logic Pro. So it's all it's all a facade. <laughs> okay, I think you get the idea. Um, so yeah, I mean, early early on, I was really kind of wrestling with these two ideas, which is the uh, on one end of the spectrum you have the arbitrary choices, which to, which to me are like the, the choices where you just make some you make a decision because it it's creative and you like it and it feels right. And then the other side of the spectrum was, you know, we have all this game data, and I really feel like it's important that the game data, that the data is expressed creat creatively and in a way that the player can hopefully begin to comprehend some of the things that are happening in the system. And so, um, yeah, so I mean, my, my thought was like, I, w I wanna find the sweet spot where we're doing both. So, you know, like the experience sonically will be very, will be highly curated. And what I mean by that is like, I'm setting up the system with, with very specific restraints so that it has a certain quality to it. Like one of the things the system does is it has, uh, it, it plays different chord progressions in different cities and stuff, and those chord progressions, it moves through them in a way that there's a lot of variety, but it's also somewhat predictable and it always sounds good. So things like that were definitely, I was spending lots of time thinking about. Um, so we knew we wanted to do a quantized system, and what I, what I mean by that is a system where everything, everything fires on a grid all the events are happening on rhythmic increments. Um, but we had to figure out, you know, how to do that. And so we started looking for tools. Uh, Mini Metro was made in Unity. Yeah, yeah, this is when it was starting to get a bit uh, over my head as well, because you started throwing around this. You know, I, I, um, you, you really had to be in charge of figuring out what exactly we wanted for, for the tech side, you know, even though I'd be the one doing most of the, um, integration, I didn't really know what exactly we were after. So. Yeah, I don't think I did either. Uh, yeah. So we just kind of went, we went about blindly, um, and the first thing that we discovered was this, this plugin for Unity called G-Audio, and um, it does stuff. You want to talk about <laughs> that a little bit? Yeah, so it's, in theory, it's a procedural you know, does granular synthesis, I had to Procedural, look up what that was. <laughs> Procedural <laughs> sample-based music sequencer. Yeah, there we go. So it, it's not really built for, um, games. for games. It's not really built for exactly what we um, wanted it to do. Like, it seems it, it sort of built to do uh, background music that doesn't interact right. exactly with the game. Like, it... it um, yeah. Uh, and it was unwieldy. Yeah, well, it, it's really good at what it does. I mean, what it does, it can... Um, it, it, it it's runs very a, esoteric and... Not because it wasn't designed for what we needed it to. We, yeah. I like initially, I really struggled with it because I was trying to basically fit a square block yeah, in a round it, hole. It did exactly what we wanted it to do, but how it integrated with Unity and how it expected to be used yeah. wasn't exactly right. So we had to figure out how to. Yeah. So there was a time it. period where I was like, "Oh, this is really frustrating." It we, was frustrating because it, it almost was perfect for us, but there was it was but just in certain ways it was so frustrating to use. use. So we like we tried to use FMOD for a while. If you're familiar with FMOD, which is like audio mid middleware tools, and uh, that was even less friendly because it, that system is not designed with uh, this sort of musical like everything's quantized. It's not designed for that. And the front end environment, and I really wanted, 
I was really trying to find a blend of workflow and performance, so where the workflow is really helpful and, and, and easy for me to get into and be creative, but also that it does the thing that we needed to do yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, because IFMOD was really good at just providing game audio, but uh, what G Audio was really good at was um, being able to precisely do uh, things on musical schedule sounds with subframe accuracy yeah. to make sure they're exactly on, on the beat. So we went back to G Audio and uh, Peter was extremely helpful in uh, helping to deconstruct it to do only the things that we really needed it to do. So we, we took out all the unnecessary components and the, we ditched the UI, like it had a UI for Unity. We got rid of that. We just focused on the things that it does best, which are scheduling events to happen on musical increments and basic sample playback. Um, yeah, just the way we had to figure the main thing we had to figure out was how to integrate it with the game so it would schedule samples based on what the game was asking right. it to do. From, a, from like a designer standpoint, like doing, doing some of the scripting and stuff, it was really cool because basically it was like, what if you had an update loop and instead of doing things uh, by the frame, you're doing them every eighth note or every triplet or whatever. And that was really fun to create like modules and stuff in that environment. And so we built, we built it out to have what we need. And so that was a lot of front end behaviors that I built in C Sharp and then a lot of back end stuff that Peter built. Oh, oh yeah, whoops, I said all that. Okay, and then began the long, arduous journey of perpetual iteration. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, Peter and I had a little, little kind of a different approach, and maybe I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, but um, I think Peter, Peter's more about like, you know, like having actual uh, results that are like measured and my approach was more like, we'll just we'll just keep doing stuff and tweaking it until it until it's right. And so, well, it's funny. Like uh, often when I talk about early access development, you know, I, I say how uh, it it can be quite a scary thing to to design to have a game that you're still designing while it's in early access because uh, most game players aren't familiar with the the iteration, like the scale the scale of iteration you have to do with game design. And right. but you know, and I and I always say that in a way like I understand the iteration that has to has to happen. But then, while talking about this just uh, over the little, little last few days with Rich, I realised I wasn't comfortable with with uh, Rich's iteration just because I it, just because it was out of my control. So you know, so we kind of just set me off in a, in a direction, and I I just did a bunch of stuff for a long time. It was a very long phase of just iterating, <laughs> figuring out what works and what doesn't, just tr just trying things at the most basic level, like. Oh, uh, I want to make the trains be a little sequencer, like that train beat idea I was talking about. So I just built it and tried it in the game, and realized that oh, this isn't this isn't something that contributes to the game being easier to parse. Um, it's actually just adding more information that the player doesn't necessarily need. So, and at that point, my role was basically adding little bits of uh, the little connections between the the game information and the audio system. So making sure that if you wanted to experiment with something. Right. You could actually get the information out of the game. So, I mean, uh, going back to the analogy thing, we started kind of getting into the concrete objects of the system and, and figuring out, you know, how to prioritize these and how to, how to make it so that there's a language that people understand. And so, you know, I had this idea for lines that the lines are electric and that the lines kind of dictate a lot of the things that happen. The lines are made up of living sequences, so uh, it's all based on game data. So things like the, the timbre, so what you have is you have a line, each line in the system has an inherent pitch to it and a rhythm, and those things can all change, but then each, each individual, like if, if the sequence is like boom, 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 if you have four stations on that line and they're all different shapes, and you'll have like four slightly different versions of that. So it'll be like, bum, bim, bum, 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 bim, bum, bum. So the timbre's changing based on the, sh the stations that are on the line. The volume of each pulse will be different depending on the number of pass, oh, I'm sorry, peeps are passengers. That's like our lingo for passengers because they're cute, peep. Uh, so peeps at a station 
uh, against the capacity of that station. There are some upgrades where you can like make the, the stations have more pe peeps. So, you know, if there's a lot, it'll be loud, and if there's a little bit, it'll be quiet. Um, and so that kind of contributes to the sounds so of bim, bum, 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 bim, bum, and it's always changing based on, you know, how many passengers you have waiting, and so it kind of gives you uh, a very subtle cue as to what your system is doing. And the pitch. The pitch of each line is different, and it's predetermined based on sequences that I kind of laid out for every level, every different city. Um, has like a harmonic progression, so it'll move from, you know, it might move from this major chord to this minor chord or whatever, and it, it does it in a way that's very fluid, because the, the oldest line will become, will uh, get the, uh, the oldest line will change pitches to become the newest line. It's, it's kind of hard to explain, and, and there's so much to talk about that we're trying to breeze through some of these topics, um, but I, I'm happy to talk about that more if you want to talk to me. Um, behavior. Right, so this is what I'm trying to explain. Pitch changes when line least recently changed is changed. So that's kind it of a, a mouthful. It took us forever to, for you to finally, like, for us to understand that together. Like, I, he, he, yeah. he, he uh, Rich was trying to explain to me, you know. This so is a very you edit the oldest line, then you upgrade yeah. the harmony index and whatever. I remember, and that, like, remember I showed that, that range, that gamut from arbitrary to data. This is way on the arbitrary scale, where it's like, I just decided that this, this was the right decision to propel the system forward so you have, you basically get the sense that, oh, this is a moving piece of music that's changing periodically. And the, the period is, is just, you know, when you've moved a certain number of lines, uh, when you've changed the line that was least recently changed. Okay. For some reason, <laughs> it was one of those, I, uh, like in theory, it should be really straightforward, but for us to communicate successfully yeah. the idea and meet it, implement it in, in code accurately took forever. So the rhythm though is something that changes whenever you change a line. So each, each city it has a set of rhythms that are, that are tied to it. So if, um, let's see if I can do this. So if, if this is the, the pulse, a city like Paris might have like these rhythms available. Da, da. Da 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 like all these like basically an array of potential rhythms and each city would have its own array to give each city a slightly different feel and whenever you change a line the rhythm of that line will change and so you have all these as you build the system up you have these different lines that have a slightly different character to them and that was another one of the the more arbitrary decisions that could have been, we could have tied it more to game data, and I was just, when I was going back through this to do the talk, I was like, oh, I should have, should have made this more tied to game data, but okay, it's okay. <laughs> uh, and then when you place the line, there's some sounds that are tied to the pitch of the line, so when you're like, when you're, when you're like using your finger or whatever to, to create a new line, and it'll just, it'll choose a pitch, like, bum, and then it'll just, it'll just have like a, like a tone that's going until you like lock it in place, and then, the the pulse dun bing bum will start going and it's all in the same all in the same pitch. Oops, uh, I forgot to do that first. Wee. Okay, so. Oops. <laughs> so trains. Uh, trains are the idea that we can't we settled on was that trains would be electrified by the line so that. You know, this idea that the lines kind of control a lot of the things underneath them. So the trains would have, uh, the trains have different kinds of engines that are available, and these are just like looping engine sounds, like, like, and if the, if the engine, if the train is empty, you just get like a, and when there, whenever it picks up a, pa uh, once it has at least one passenger in the train, it switches from like a noise based sound to a tonal sound. So if the line is going bing, bum, bum, boom, there's a train going on it with no passengers in it going chick, 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 chick. And then when it picks up a passenger, it goes chick, 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 And it all kind of like becomes part of this, it's, it becomes like an instrument. Or that was the idea. And so the different engines can have different timbres just to mix it up, um, different different like, you know, rhythmic qualities like a chicka 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 or chicka 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 or cha 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 or whatever. Um, 
<laughs> and we tried a lot of stuff with the trains, but ultimately decided to make it really simple, relatively speaking. And maybe it still sounds a little complicated, but it's not as complicated as some of the other things. Uh, right, so this is what I just said. Oh, so when trains, when they stop to pick up a passenger, they'll go ch. So that was a ver that became a very important uh, piece of language, um, and, and just explaining oh that a train has stopped and is picking up passengers. If a train, uh, a, a train only does that when it picks up passengers, because it can stop and not pick up passengers, right? So if it does that, you don't get a ch. <laughs> and this all happens in time too. So on uh, on the hour, I believe in the game, which would be on like the downbeat. The train stopping are the one thing that can happen any time. Oh, okay, but the actual sound is quantized anyway. Right. So the, <laughs> in general, like the visual stuff uh, on screen and the sound are completely synced to each other. But in this case, it, we were able to kind of blur it a little bit um, so the trains can pick up and drop off whenever, right? Or is it just? Dropping off. It's just when they stop. Yeah, okay. Just when the train stops can happen whenever, but the actual exhaust sound is always firing on a musical yeah. increment. And there are some unique engines. Um, there's a level, Kyoto, which has a Shinkansen, which is like a, a really fast train. Um, I saw someone go, yeah, Shinkansen. Uh, so that has like a special sound, and those move faster. Um, and that was one of the things we got into later in development. We wanted certain levels to have their own unique feel. And some of those things were gameplay, and some of those were um, sonic choices that I made. Okay. Yay. Uh, oops. Yeah. <laughs> so those are, those are the sound. I'm going to play that again, because that was kind of. So those are kind of the sounds for when a new station appears. Each one of those sounds has like a unique uh, element that's tied to the verb for station appear. But then there's also an element that says this is a triangle, or this is a square, or this is a circle. So the, the square is kind of like a okay, kind of thing, and the circle is kind of like a and the triangle is kind of like a tss. And that language carries over into the passengers themselves. So when, when a little passenger appears, you just get like the, the or the sound like by itself. And so this, this was one of the early things, uh, I don't know, maybe it wasn't too early, but this became really important that shapes are dictate, uh, shapes have like a percussive qual, like a percussive sound tied to them. Um, it became important in like des describing the or creating like a language for the environment. <clears throat> so um, each shape has a unique percussive sound. I, I got to remember not to get ahead of the slides. I keep doing this. So the shape information is passed onto the line. So if you have a line and it has a triangle, a square, and a circle on it, and the line is doing that bing, bam, boom, boom, it's getting that information from the the stations to say, you know, what, what kind of stations, are, you know, what kind of station are you? And, okay, so you're a triangle, you're a square, you're a circle, so I know that I need a sequence that's three pitches long, and the first one is going to play this, like, triangle version of the pitch, which is like, bing, or the square version, which is bum, etc. Yeah, that, that's actually really helpful information for someone who's playing the game as well. Like, you, the worst thing you want is, like, if you've got <coughs> circles, circle, 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 and a line, that's bad. So you can actually hear that now. Yeah, what, what, what's interesting is that in the beginning, the system is made up primarily of the, the primary shapes, which are the circle, the square, and the triangle. But as the system evolves, you start to get different kinds of stations that are kind of reflective of different kinds of points of interest in a city. Like you might get like a star or like a cross, which is like a hospital, basically. And those sounds are slightly more noticeable. So in the general like landscape of the music slash sound, you start to hear these like little new sounds that are, you know, like you might have a you might have a hospital way on the left side of the screen and then so you'll start hearing like a little like 
different kind of sound on the left side of the screen that I think just, just helps to draw attention to that as the player. Um, behavior. So stations can spawn and they can also mutate. They can change. Five minutes? Oh, that's not as bad. Okay. Um, this is also a, a bass sound that will play underneath when one of these stations appears and that's just to kind of give a sense of the system moving. All right, I'm gonna have to move really quickly now. Um, so then there's peeps. So those are some examples of peeps. They take the, they, they use the, the shape system. Um, uh, we're not gonna have time to talk about that, so I'll skip that. Uh, so when they spawn, there's a percussive sound. When they get on a train, they make a sound that's tonal to match the line. So if the line is boom, then the sound will be boop, and the same pitch to kind of make that more cohesive. Uh, when you disembark, there's no sound because we decided that that wasn't as important to the player. Um, sign of sound effects, I hope you like sine waves. Um, I basically took really simple sine waves plus uh, this tool called S-Layer, which kind of just randomizes a bunch of parameters and you get really interesting results with it. And so I created almost all these sound effects using sine waves. So here's some examples of those. Those are just a couple. Um, <laughs> cities are not the same, so we, we had to build a loadout system. Man, we're not gonna get to any of this stuff. We had to build a loadout system where each each city has unique variations. Uh, uh, you know, there's different harmonic progressions for different cities, uh, different rhythms available. You can change keys. You can give it, give it like a set of keys to choose from. You can change the attack time of sample. So instead of boom, it's like whoosh. So certain levels have like a much more like ambient sound to them. I think like Sao Paulo is like really ambient, which is kind of cool. And you can also change it when the game is paused or fast forward. Um, different engine types. Uh, you can, oops, you can do swing. You can swing things if you like jazz. Um, you can add one-off things like Berlin has a kick drum because why not? Uh, <laughs> and it goes on and on. And then we had some we had some charts for loadout, but we're yeah. not going to get we're not going to be able to get through this no, stuff. Th so. This is this basically represents the uh, when we were going from Rich just hacking around in C sharp to try and get into a template a, a to building a template, right? Data driven format, so so Rich could easily still experiment, but um, it was all yeah uh, a lot more controlled. And then we have different pulses that we were using. We're not really going to talk about that synchronization. Um, this will all be online. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I guess that we could just get into the, the main issue with um, yeah, for, wanna... for game design. I mean, sorry, for game development for us, um, when we started to have to synchronize, uh, this, we had this pulse running in the audio thread that was running at exactly the same uh, frequency as the hours ticked by in the game. Um, because that was all controlled in the audio thread, and, um, you know, that the audio thread just advances regardless of what's happening in the game to, to try and synchronize the, the main thread and how the game's actually updating with that audio thread uh, was, a, was quite a bit of work. Um, I'm not sure what, yeah, we can't go through all of this right now, so I'm no, not sure what the most important thing is. This is a basic flowchart of how stuff works. It goes in and um, you can put a bunch of different modules into it and then it makes sound. <laughs> uh, you're not really gonna get to talk about that stuff. Uh, damn. Game enemies. Okay, so the game doesn't run without the audio engine, which was kind of a bad thing. Yeah, because it, because the game uh, relies on synchronizing with the audio thread um, before it starts, so it makes sure that when it starts, it's starting at the exact time that a pulse is, is activated on the audio thread. Uh, I, yeah. I didn't check to see whether it actually worked without an audio thread. So the first time we pushed an audio build up. Uh, the, a handful of people that for some reason didn't have an audio card or audio was disabled in the system or whatever, the game just would, would sit there and, and not start. And like, all. really, and re <clears throat> sorry, really late in development, uh, we decided that we needed a twice as fast mode. And so we had built all this stuff and then we had to go back and figure out like, okay, now how do we like change the tempo on the fly? <laughs> and it was like, it was a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, but we figured it out. Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, two thousand. Yeah, I think, and one of the important things I think to is the whole 
how we tie the audio to the, the way the game plays. So, um, for example, when the passengers, uh, the speed at which the passengers hop onto a train, that was all synchronised with the audio. So before that happened, uh, we could change the speed, you know, we could fiddle around with the speed and figure out how fast a passenger hops on and off. We can use that to make, um, to differentiate gameplay between different cities and stuff like that. And, but then once it was synchronised with the audio, if Rich made an audio change, it would affect the gameplay. If we made a gameplay change, it would affect the audio. So we, we lost some um, versatility there. Um, so really quick, some interpersonal stuff. This was a big part of our, our process because we're, we're pretty, we're different. Uh, uh, different skill sets, uh, different work approach. So Peter's more of a categorize, organize, and finish kind of guy. And I think he was more set on feature control. Uh, yeah, I, I like, to, like to know where things are at, I think. That's fair yeah. enough. I was more like tweak, fiddle, and experiment. Feature creep as like a means to en an end. Uh, Time zones, which actually didn't turn out to be that bad of a big of a problem. Yeah, we've only got about four hours time difference, but Rich works quite l light, so it yeah. uh, worked out well. Language was actually really hard for a while, especially just doing like Slack chat. Um, learning all the Kiwi lingo was really yeah, difficult. Yeah, and Simis is, is just <laughs> awful with people you don't He's know like, what, that what well. Is it? And then yeah. also like, like and just our knowledge base, like what the... WTF is an arpeggio. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that uh, you know, Rich intimately knew as an audio developer and, and didn't realize that ordinary people don't know these things. Yeah, you know, so. so we tried a novel approach in order to better understand each other. I went to New Zealand and we got to know each other a little bit and I played with Pete's kids, um, which was probably the most important yeah, part of it's development. Yeah, it's funny, I just have to say, like, <laughs> you know, I, I sing to my, uh, I sing to them every night, you know, ba ba bollock sheep, that kind of stuff. Um, the one, the one night that Rich was there as well, and and sang next to me to the kids. I'm like, oh wow, I I sound really bad, don't I? <laughs> Sorry. But <laughs> so I, I, hopefully they were young You're enough fine. that they've forgotten about that now. But anyway. so this is this is pretty much where the the audio is now, just to kind of put things in perspective. Data stuff and uh, and it's okay. it's now we just released on iOS and Android yesterday. So uh, I think it was iPads edited its choice in the states. So yay! So yeah. yes, we are on iOS and Android. Yes, finally, as of like today or yesterday. Something. Yeah. Woohoo! Thank you guys. Yeah. Um, if you want to talk to us, we'll be around. We'd love to talk more about this. We're nerds. Yeah, I mean, I've been working this for three and a half years. I, I don't want to stop now, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cool. Cheers.